Hey everybody, Nick Licamelli here on Technique Peak. Today we're talking about pregnancy. Now I'm not going to be explaining how a woman gets pregnant. That conversation is for someone other than me. Today we're talking about the positive impact that a physical therapist can have on a woman who's going through the pregnancy process. Here are some examples of some activities that would really benefit a woman who's pregnant as well as some other things to keep in mind with this type of patient. Let's take a look. Okay, so just a couple slides here about some of the benefits and things to consider when we're talking about exercise uh, with the pregnant uh, population. So the first uh, main benefit is decreased fat gain during pregnancy. So yes, we want, we want the woman to gain weight, um, but too much weight gain is, is, is not a good thing. Um, exercise may improve the uh, fetal response to decrease uh, placental blood flow. So in times like uh, during contractions, uh, this will kind of make the, um, the fetal uh, response more resilient uh, during these times. Exercise reduces the risk of a large birth weight, and there really seems to be no uh, short-term or long-term adverse effects uh, with exercise uh, for the fetus. And improvements in labor and delivery, so there uh, is some evidence to show that there is a de decreased risk of C-section. So what changes occur during pregnancy? We're going to start with cardiac changes. So first we have vasodilation and reduced uh, responsiveness, right? So there is vascular underfilling, and as we know, that can lead to things like lightheadedness when we, for example, transition from supine to sit. Uh, there is hormonal uh, water retention, and there's increased cardiac output by about 40% by the end of pregnancy, right? So exercise can improve cardiac output by 30 to 50%, uh, which can help provide um, blood flow uh, to both the mother and the fetus. All right, some respiratory changes. So the increase in progesterone increases respiratory rate in order to increase oxygen and decrease CO2. Um, we also have an, uh, an elevation and uh, increase in elevation and width of the rib cage uh, due to you know the obvious uh, physical changes that occur. And uh, the woman could feel shortness of breath at normal pre-pregnancy uh, resting heart rate. So exercise can help increase oxygen uptake and increase the efficiency of transport and utilization of that oxygen. Okay, so metabolic changes. So we have a slowing of the GI tract, which is in order to um, increase nutrient absorption. We have an increase in insulin sensitivity and increase in fat storage. So we have a decrease in fat usage for energy and increase in carbohydrate usage. Now that doesn't mean that um, there is a, uh, that, that just means in, in the, the short term, right? So when we use different um, macro uh, nutrients for energy, this just means that we're using less fat in the moment and more carbohydrate in the moment. But at the end of the day, um, fat gain is dependent on total caloric intake, right? So this is just um, in the short term what we get, what the, the pregnant woman gets the energy from. It's not like, um, you know, that she's going to have a decreased uh, fat loss or something like that because of this, um, this divvying up of the fat versus carbohydrate usage. It's just where she gets the energy from in the short term. Um, a woman should gain about 25 to 35 pounds. And uh, the common uh, thought is that the woman is eating for two, right? Um, it's, it's, we joke about that, uh, but in reality, pregnancy only requires about 300 uh, extra calories per day. And it's not much, right? So it's uh, about a, three quarters of a Starbucks blueberry muffin or about five to six Oreos. So uh, not, so, not, not much, much food there. Um, and uh, we want to maintain moderate uh, to intense uh, exercise to the end of pregnancy because that can prevent excessive weight gain. And it's interesting, studies show that women who exercise uh, but stop and don't exercise throughout till the end of their pregnancy actually 
gain more weight and gain more fat than someone who never exercised at all during their pregnancy. And the idea is that it may be due to the fact that uh, women who exercise and then stop um, may uh, continue to eat how they ate when they exercised or um, some uh, other factors that maybe go into it, right? So why did the woman stop exercising? Maybe it has to do with depression. Maybe it's, you know, um, a multitude of different things that, that may cause that, that person to, to gain more weight. But I thought that was very interesting. Okay, so body temperature. The woman is less able to regulate body temperature, which means that she should avoid exercising in hot environments. Uh, so things like hot yoga, saunas, hot tubs, steam rooms, right? These things should be avoided during pregnancy. And the warning signs, of course, are uh, profuse sweating, skin redness, and dizziness or nausea. Musculoskeletal changes, these are pretty self-explanatory um, and probably the area where we are most familiar. The center of gravity is moved up and outward, right? It's pretty, um, if you just look at a, a pregnant woman, you can, you can see that. Uh, and then we have an increase in all the spinal curves, right? So the lordosis in the neck the kyphosis of the, the uh, thoracic spine and the lordosis of the lumbar spine are all going to be increased. And we're going to have an increase in laxity, right, of ligaments and joints, especially in the anterior pelvis. So I'm not going to go through all of these absolute contraindications. Many of them are self-explanatory, but you can kind of freeze the screen here if you want to take a look at these. Relative contraindications, same thing. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but if you want to stop the screen here and just kind of take a look. And these, of course, um, we're going to stop exercise. If you see any of these these things happen, of course, I, vaginal bleeding, I can't imagine anyone, uh, any uh, uh, patient telling their physical therapist, I'm bleeding from my vagina, and the therapist says, oh, that's okay, we'll keep, keep pushing harder, and... <laughs> We'll keep going, uh, yeah. So we definitely want to stop exercise if if we're <laughs> bleeding from the vagina, if we are uh, having painful contractions, right? If if there is amniotic fluid leakage, um, all these different things, dizziness, headache, chest pain, um, obviously calf pain or swelling, right? So all things to look out for. Uh, I would say pretty much across the board if these things ever happen to anyone, regardless if they're pregnant or not. But um, but yeah, these are. Some things you want to keep an eye out for, especially in the pregnant population. All right, so we all know that exercise is beneficial for pregnant women, but how do we prescribe it, right? What's the intensity, the duration, uh, the type, and the frequency? So the intensity, we want to aim for about a 3 to 4 on a 1 to 10 RPE scale, right? So um, we ask the patient uh, how intense the, the exercise uh, feels, and they should be rating it around a three or four. We don't want to go much above that, and we don't want to go much below that. The talk test is kind of a quick and dirty way to also assess this. Uh, as we want to uh, see if the woman can talk, if she can maintain a conversation as she's exercising, right? If she's gasping for air and she can't quite hold a conversation, that may be a little too intense, um, but if she is, uh, is not working at all, and she's easily, um, you know, holding a conversation that may not be quite enough. So we want to just kind of teeter on that, that threshold there. Um, heart rate uh, alone, this is an important point, uh, heart rate alone is not an accurate um, way to, to measure exercise intensity because of the cardiovascular and hormonal changes uh, that occur. Okay, so duration, we want to shoot for 20 to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise per session. Um, if we can't get to that 20 minutes to 45 minutes, um, we want to modify the intensity in order to meet that requirement. Okay, so drop the intensity if that's what it takes in order to meet this time, uh, this duration requirement. And uh, if you have to, um, depending on how far the pregnancy has advanced and, and how the woman is doing, you can divide this into two sessions, um, you know, as the pregnancy progresses. So the type is very important because we want to be st uh, strategic in our positioning, right? So um, we want to obviously avoid the supine position. Um, it can cause dizziness and it kind of just puts some, some pressure on, on, on the, the blood vessels and 
can be quite uncomfortable uh, for a pregnant woman. So uh, we want to elevate the, the the upper body if we can. Um, we use pillows, which we'll, we'll see in uh, in the videos uh, to come. Um, we, want to, we want the exercise type to be easily modifiable. So kind of like I was just mentioning with um, side lying or, or elevating the back, we want uh, the exercises to be easily modifiable depending on, on, the, on how the woman is doing. Uh, something the patient will enjoy, right? Because in any diet, in any exercise program, research shows that the most important thing is not the method or not the mode of exercise or not the type of diet, it is adherence. Adherence is the most important thing. So we want something that um, they they enjoy doing. If they hate uh, running, we're not going to recommend running, right? If they if they uh, if they love uh, bike riding or they love swimming, we're going to use that, right? We're going to use that um, to in order to improve adherence. Pelvic floor exercises um, are really really beneficial and. You can really progress them and regress them easily. Uh, one, the basic uh, idea here is that at, at its core, there are two different ways to kind of do these pelvic floor exercises, and it's the the way that you want to kind of explain it is almost like you're pulling up on your pelvic floor, like you're holding in gas or urine, right? So there are two ways to do it: short duration, high reps or long duration, low reps. So short duration, high reps is kind of like quick spurts of contraction. So contract, 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 um, you know, maybe up until 30 reps and then you can take a break. Long duration, low reps would be like a slow five second controlled contraction. So it's not a max contraction, max contraction, max contraction. It's a mild contraction to moderate contraction to max contraction hold for another five seconds and then a max contraction to a moderate contraction to a relaxed contraction um, on a, in a five second on the way down and controlling that will um, will help the woman during during delivery because um, she she knows what that feels like right she knows what it feels like to relax that pelvic floor when the time comes um, and then you can you can add different things to that right so you can do different positions we can challenge the um, challenge those those pelvic floor muscles in different ways, um, and that's really been shown to, to be beneficial. We want to be careful with high impact and high risk activities like gymnastics, skiing, horseback riding, scuba diving. Right, all these things. It's important, like I just said, to do something and find something that the patient enjoys doing. But at the same time, we want to educate our patients um, on on some of these activities that we may have to or not not completely throw out of you know throw out but maybe just modify a bit frequency we want to shoot for three to six days per week and um, just like how we modified the intensity to meet the duration requirements we are going to modify intensity and duration in order to meet these frequency frequency requirements so it's better to have the, the woman exercise at this frequency, um, even if it means a lower duration or a lower intensity. And of course, we're always, always asking for feedback and modifying before we just get rid of something, right? Very, very important. Okay, so I just want to give this reference here because this is pretty much where I got most of the information for these slides. It's a fantastic course on MedBridge. I really um, encourage you guys to check it out to kind of dive into um, dive into this a little bit more if you have any further questions. And uh, the references here are also from that presentation. So feel free to dive in to these on your own if this is an area that you are interested in. All right, so now we are going to jump into some in-clinic footage of... Uh, treatment with a pregnant woman. So let's get into it. All right, so what better way to talk about prenatal exercise than with an actual real live pregnant woman? And I happen to have one right here.
And that pregnant woman just happens to be my beautiful wife, Carly. That's right, everybody. That is Mrs. Technique Peak herself. We film these uh, these clips throughout her pregnancy, which uh, has been an unbelievable experience. I don't have to explain that to anyone who's, who's experienced it themselves. At the time of this recording, uh, we are expecting the baby any day now. So I am not a father now, and by the time you're watching it, I will be a father, which is so cool to think. But hey, that's not what this video is about. This video is about prenatal exercise. So we're gonna go through some of her exercises that she was doing. We're gonna talk about why she's doing them, how she's doing them, and also um, the reasons why she uh, came to physical therapy in the first place. So Carly was coming to us with um, radiculopathy coming from her back, right? So she was having some sciatic uh, symptoms into her leg, as well as some neck and upper um, left upper extremity radiculopathy as well, which kind of all worsened um, as her pregnancy progressed. So here we're just starting with some treadmill walking. So prolonged walking was a provocative uh, activity for her. So we are using the treadmill to, um, to go through some graded exposure to that activity. So we're walking on the treadmill for a duration that brings her to the right up to that edge of discomfort, right? And then we're gonna stop, take a break, and then kind of push that threshold a little bit more. This way we kind of raise that threshold over time through that graded exposure to that activity. And like we talked about on the slides, we want to also um, train the cardiovascular system, right? So we don't want her to get out of breath when she walks across the room or walks up and down the stairs. So the treadmill is a great way to work on all of that. And we also um, got Carly a brace. Uh, we got her a brace as her pregnancy progressed just to kind of relieve some, some pain in the short term. I don't mind uh, prescribing a brace uh, for something like pregnancy because there's there's really no chance of getting dependent on it because the pregnancy process is 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 inherently temporary, right? So she's not going to be dependent on this brace. It's just going to be something that helps make her feel more comfortable. On to the next exercise here, we have the leg press. Now, uh, what, like we said in the slides, it's very important to include strength training into her program and you can see she's not doing you know lightweight she's she's loading that right right she's loading that tissue and that's what we want we want progressive overload uh with a good strengthening program just like any other population right have to have to overload those tissues to get the changes that we want it's pretty much a low risk exercise she's in a good posture here good position on the seat and she's uh it, it's easy to kind of load and unload this movement and modify it as needed so here, it, it just looks like she's having a ball. Yes, if you thought the dad jokes were bad before fatherhood, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. So I like the physio ball here. It adds some instability, and it challenges her to um, kind of maintain a somewhat neutral spine. Neutral is, of course, a spectrum, but we're challenging her spine to stay nice and, and stable as she's moving her arms with some resistance. So same concept here on the ball with the weighted scaption. Um, we are forcing her to stabilize herself on the ball as she is lifting uh, the weight with her upper extremities. Because when she goes to lift something, we want her to know what it feels like to stabilize her spine as she goes to lift the load. Up next is the good old squat. And I like using a TRX or any kind of suspension uh, trainer here because I want her to hold that position in the bottom. I want her to feel what that feels like to be in that hole in the bottom of the squat um, and controlling her lower back, right? I want her to be able to control that lordosis and not just kind of fall into that lordosis. I want her to control her lumbo-pelvic junction as she sits into that squat. And in that position, she's also getting good burn in the quads and the glutes. Speaking of burning quads and glutes, I love this weighted pull. I love this for a few reasons. The strap is kind of right where her glutes meet her lumbar spine. So it's pulling her into a lordosis. So she is being forced to kind of resist that lordosis and control her pelvis as she's moving, which again, we want her to do whenever she's um, walking or lifting a load. We want her to control her spine and her pelvis and prevent falling into that lordosis uncontrollably. Up next, we have a deadlift from the floor. So this is kind of more like a sumo deadlift with a medicine ball. She has been taught to keep the load close to her body and lift with her legs, keeping a relatively flat back 
tight upper body and kind of go down right into that hip hinge to lift the load. So we're going to groove this movement and we're going to load this movement so that it has good functional carryover whenever she wants to lift something up from the floor. Up next is another one of my favorites, the hip thrust. So the bands here, I put them like this because I wanted to load the hip thrust, but when we load the hip thrust, usually we place a weight on the lower abdomen. Obviously, we're not going to do that with a woman who's pregnant, so I have the band wrapped around her proximal thighs and under her feet to kind of resist that um, explosive hip, hip extension, and then I have a band around her knees so that she is pressing out into the band and isometrically um, working on hip abduction as well. I like the hip thrust for a couple different reasons, the main one being that at the top of that um, exercise, at the top in that top position, she is squeezing her glutes and coming out of that lumbar lordosis and kind of letting that lower back round into a little bit of a posterior pelvic tilt. As she descends down into the bottom position, she is going into a bit of a lordosis, however, it is controlled. So I want her to not avoid a lordosis, but I want her to be able to control that position. Up next, we have a classic core exercise here, and that is the kneeling chop. So she is uh, kneeling with uh, one foot right in front of her knee, so she's kind of like on a tightrope. That makes this very challenging. She has to stabilize everything from her feet all the way up to her torso. And I don't want her rotating um, because you want to be careful with rotation um, with women who are pregnant. So I want her to keep her, her trunk and her torso stable and just move her arms and maintain that neutral spine and that stable spine. Now you don't want to avoid rotation. It's not dangerous, but you just want to be careful with it. Up next is just the UBE, right? So this is a fantastic way to work on some endurance. Um, not necessarily the goal here isn't to strengthen her arms. It's just to kind of work on her cardiovascular health and train endurance here, which is very, very important. Um, again, we don't want her to get winded with everyday activities. We want her to build up her endurance. And um, here we're going to stand up. So now she has to stabilize her entire spine as she is propelling the UBE. Up next, we're going to do a modified bird dog. Now, it's modified because um, with, with pregnant women, the one, one thing that you want to watch out for is really stressing the uh, muscles of the anterior abdomen, right? So you want to avoid a lot of tension uh, in the anterior abdomen, so things like planks or crunches. You want to be careful with um, forcefully contracting the um, rectus abdominis as it gets stretched during the pregnancy. So we're doing a modified bird dog here. The mat on the floor is a fantastic way to measure progress. So the further she moves her feet out from the table, the harder the exercise will be. And that mat is actually numbered each of the lines so that she can measure her progress each time she does this. She can try to move her feet back further and further um, to kind of progress this exercise. So again, she's keeping a neutral spine as she lifts her arm and her leg. She's squeezing her glute as she lifts the back leg, and she's not rotating. She's not falling into a lordosis. If anyone is interested in having that mat uh, in their office, um, just shoot me an email, and uh, we can make that happen for you. So no, this isn't nap time, um, but we're going to finish up with some strategic ways to properly position a pregnant uh, woman. The pillow between the knees helps take some pressure off the lower back and sciatic nerve. Um, and the pillow underneath the belly area um, helps kind of unweight that, that belly. It's, you know, it's a decent amount of weight pulling her down. So a pillow underneath um, the side of her belly really helps with that. And lying, side lying is typically a, comfort, a comfortable position. Sometimes supine can be a bit uncomfortable with all of that weight kind of pressing down into her. Um, so side lying tends to be a position of comfort. Uh, you can also kind of build up uh, the pillows uh, on her back if she is lying on her back um, to elevate her up a little bit. That, um, that will also sometimes do the trick. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Technique Peak. I hope this helped, and we'll see you next time.